right. Well, here's what else that we are watching at this hour. With one and a half trading days left in the year, time is running out for the S&P and the NASDAQ to scratch out some gains. Keep in mind, the S&P 500 has finished down on the last trading day of the year in six of the past seven years. Today, though, well, anybody's guess. Still got two hours to go. Today's market leaders, Bank of America, JPM, and Hewlett Packard. Masco leading the S&P 500, maybe a housing play there. Remember faucets, et cetera. And News Corp topping the NASDAQ. You've heard about that positive note from RBC Capital Markets. It is their top pick for the next year. There is housing hopium as well. Pending home sales soaring to 19-month highs. Sales rising 7.3% in November. And that topped the expectation of analysts by about five-fold. Wow. Meantime, the euro plunging to a 10-year low against the yen and at a one-year low against the dollar. Italian government debt auctions seeing higher yields. David Faber just talked about that. Gold also continuing to drop. It is now in bear market territory from its highs. Prices down more than 20% from that record that it hit back in September. Still, though, gold on track for its 11th straight year of gains. So gold bugs still have some faith. All right. So how does all of this play out into the markets heading into 2012? Joining us now is Keith Springer, president of Springer Financial Advisors, as well as Mark Tepper, managing partner of Strategic Wealth Partners. Keith, much will be made about the S&P, right? We're sort of right on that razor's edge. Are we going to be up or down for the year? The Dow, unless we collapse today or tomorrow, is going to finish higher for the year. Question to you is, do we care about that statistic? Uh, hey, Brian, you know, basically, you, we don't really care about the last couple of days. Typically, this is normal. you got some tax loss selling at the beginning of the week, people buying the bargains that are being created by this tax loss selling. This statistic doesn't matter so much. I think we're going to be up. What investors really need to do is find a way to get the best return without all the risk. You know, that's what we'd like to do for our clients. That's really the key out there, Brian, is really get people to find the best return find that sweet spot on the market, get the best return without all the risk. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just rolling the dice and you, you don't want to roll the dice with your nest egg. And Mark Tepper, you believe that, yeah, OK, there are names out there that are positive. But on right. the whole, you are cautious on the overall market. So to Keith's point, where do you find some of that relatively safe return right now? I mean, one of the things that we're looking at is making sure that we're focusing on dividends over the course of 2012 and probably beyond that. Uh, when you emerge from a financial crisis, you're going to have periods of sluggish growth and heightened volatility. And I mean, that's really the, the one area of, of the equity markets that's really flashing by right now for us would be those high dividend paying stocks. Such you, as? Uh, Verizon would be a good one. Johnson & Johnson, Altria, Bristol Myers. Uh, a lot of the big boys, strong companies, good solid balance sheets, and they've got good track records of consistently paying dividends. Keith, do you buy into that? I mean, I hear what Mark is saying, right? But this year was also the year of the dividend. Utilities, for example, outperforming, mm -hmm. nice dividend, but many of them are trading at 16, 17 times forward earnings. No, you got it right on the button. I, I do like utilities, but they are trading a little high. I like uh, what your other guest was saying about dividends, but I'd go one step further. I think corporate bonds, preferred stocks, the higher dividend paying type of stocks. I think the tip Typical stocks that just pay a market average dividend still have too much risk. The key is to reduce the risk. If you can go out there, you know, we're finding 8, 9, 10% yields on some preferreds, MLPs, corporate bonds. That's 80 or 90% of the return typically of the stock market with only 10 or 20% of the risk. That's where you want to look. I really think many of those stocks with small dividends of 2, 3, 4%, they might be nice compared to the market, but I still think there's too much risk if the market folds. You know, the ultimate riskless play is cash in a milk crate buried in the backyard, right, Mark? Yeah. So, so give us a reason to be in equities at all. Well, you know, capital is going to chase yield, whether it's in the form of growth, interest rates, or dividends. And we're really not seeing too much growth. You know, we're, we're looking at sub-2% GDP growth. Uh, interest rates are essentially zero. So really, the only place for investors to achieve some yield is by investing in companies that pay dividends. And you like an ETF as well, the DVY. I'm a little, yeah. I'm a little wary. You know, my colleague Herb Greenberg is not here. He is more wary on ETFs than I am. But I still remain somewhat wary because of fees, expenses, whatever. You're not exactly sure all the time what's in this. Why, why are you so confident on DVY? I think DVY, it, it just holds a good basket of, of good, solid dividend-paying companies. And if you actually look at the relative performance of DVY compared to the S&P 500 since about March of this year, uh, it's significantly outperforming the rest of the stock market. 
At that same point in time, that's where Treasury yields began dropping. So we're seeing a high inverse correlation between Treasury yields and also the performance of these dividend paying stocks. So what's happening is investors again are chasing yield. And if you can't get it in the form of interest rates and you can't get it in the form of growth, you got to look at the dividends. And Keith, I'm going to end it with you, right? It's the time of year when we offer up not only glasses of champagne, but also predictions and we force our guests to make them. Is Europe going to be a bigger or a smaller risk and fear in 2012 than it was this year? It's going to be smaller to begin with, which is going to help our markets, and it's going to become a bigger problem as the year goes on, and that's when we'll see it. I think the year starts off pretty strong, and then we have the end of QE2 we're going to start feeling, and uh, Europe is going to come in, and that's when the problems might arise. So good beginning, tough middle and ending. Mark, and to you, and don't say dividend players. We heard that. Give us another prediction or surprise or whatever in 2012. Come on. 2012, I'd say uh, we, we could expect appreciation of you know maybe 5 to 7%. So it's going to be modest appreciation. We should close out the year higher than where we start, mm -hmm. but it's going to be another roller coaster ride. There will be times throughout the year where we're in the negative. Uh, and if you have a good strategy and you can see it through from the beginning to the end of the year, you should see some appreciation and, and scoop up the dividends, too. Mark and Keith, gentlemen, both happy new year. We'll see Thanks. you Same in you. 2012. Happy new year, Brian. Thank All you. Right. Well, we want to hear from you, dear viewer. What are your market and stock predictions for 2012? You can tweet us at Street Signs CNBC. We're going to share some of the best responses at the end of the show. Could be a market prediction, could be individual stock names. Anybody who mentions RIM will be deleted. All right, let's get right now to the trading floors. Bob Pizzotti is at the New York Stock Exchange. Rick Santelli is in Chicago. Bob, I want to begin with you, because when I see and say that Masco yeah. is leading the S&P 500, I'm Who thinking maybe there's a little uh, housing hopium here. Yeah, I'll tell you the good news is there's some kind of bottom being uh, put in in housing, uh, Brian. The, the bad news is it's not clear what kind of recovery we're having, if at all. So sales seem to have been bottoming to some extent. Prices seem to be bottoming, although they're declining in a few markets, depending on where you are. I'll tell you what puzzles me a little. Remember, I'm the son of a home builder. I was the original real estate reporter for CNBC 20 years ago. So these stocks I know very, very well. Put up home builders for the quarter. This is the great home building rally that we have seen. Seen, uh, in the fourth quarter, we've seen some of the big names like Pulte up about 50 percent on the quarter. Look at this, Brian, 50, 45. The, the S&P is up one percent in this quarter. I'm a little puzzled by this because the level of vacant units is around one and a half million. That's really high. The stress sales levels really high still. That's going to impact this for a while. Something that makes a little more sense is what you were just mentioning, Masco and the building construction group. That's because, look at this here, this is the quarter. That's because apartment construction is going to be really strong. It was strong this year, is up 50 percent. John Burns is a very respected housing consultant, says it's going to be a much bigger part of residential, uh, of multi uh, of permitting uh, for housing in the next several years. Could be as yeah. high as 50 well, percent. You know, that makes sense to me. There's a lot of some companies out there, subsidiary, USG, you know, we talked about right. Masco, even Mohawk, sort of maker of textiles that have done well. You know, you've got some hedge funds now that were famously anti-housing like Kyle Bass, right, yeah. who called subprime. His Heyman Capital took a big stake in MGIC, a mortgage insurer, in the third quarter. So even some of the biggest negative funds out there previously are starting to turn a little more positive on housing-related investments. Yeah, and I've started to see some interesting ideas from some of the hedge funds about how they can get more investment and buy housing in a very big way, buy big lots of housing and get the market moving a little bit better. I, I think one thing is if you can get those distressed sales, if you can move them a little quicker through the system, this whole thing, you can start seeing a clearer recovery rather than just the bottom a lot quicker. I think you see 2012 more creative ideas for moving housing. Rick Santelli, give us your views on either housing. I know you're a big fan of housing subsidies through Fannie and Freddie. Please note my sarcasm on that one. Give us your views on 2012 and what you see happening, housing or otherwise. Come on. Well, I think in terms of housing, we don't know, as Bob said, what the short sales, what foreclosures, the banks are not reeling out into the marketplace. And I really think that's a huge issue. And I don't see the logistics to clean this up, anything workable to speed it up. As far as what's in store for 2012, look no farther than the 10-year UK gilt, under 2%, historic all-time low yield. The credit markets are still nervous. Many traders are a bit nervous. We're going to get S&P down downgrades, Moody's downgrades of more European financial entities, and many times those happen during lulls in the market.
market, think holiday time that we're in now. Those are the issues we're watching closely. And is guilt an acceptable four-letter Scrabble word? <laughs> yes or no? I need you to settle it a bet, sure is. Rick. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. We settled that. It's a big one. Bund and guilt if you need Scrabble words this weekend. Guys, thank you very much.